should tell you that uh, the widespread interest uh, that we have in, in this plan. Um, and so uh, the format for tonight's event really is just to present information about the plan and then give you all opportunities to ask a live person from the base uh, any questions that you may have. So the format for tonight's presentation, to set some ground rules, is uh, we'll run through the presentation, then we'll take a break, and I'll give you folks an opportunity to write down questions. Our public affairs staff will be handing out three by five cards to help us manage the questions. After the break, we'll come back, we'll run through the, the questions that are on the cards, get those questions answered, and then any time we have remaining after that, uh, we'll, we'll open up the mic and let you come to the mic and ask your questions that way. I will let you know that we do have a hard stop at 8 o'clock tonight. Uh, that's as far as we have the room, and we have to give it back to Gulf Coast State College. And uh, thanks to the folks at Gulf Coast for allowing us to use their facility this evening. You know, Tindo Air Force Base recognizes the importance of being an integral part of the community. And it's a community where we live and serve right alongside uh, members of the public. And so to, to foster open and honest dialogue about what's going on at Tyndall, um, that's why we're here, to talk about our, our waterway security plan. And so we brought a lot of folks. You see a lot of blue uniforms here in the front row. Uh, we brought a lot of folks out that you can interact one-on-one -on -one with to ask your questions, express your concerns, and, and we'll answer those for you. Uh, to let you know that kind of the, the scope of folks that you have in front of you this evening, as I mentioned, I'm the mission support group commander at Tyndall. I'm the one responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of Tyndall Air Force Base. Uh, we have Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford from our uh, Judge Advocate General Corps. We have members of our public affairs staff. We have members of our security forces. And of course, our security forces commander, uh, Major McCarty. And so since this waterway security plan is about security, what I'm going to do is turn the microphone over and the presentation now to uh, Major McCarty, our security forces commander. So, Anthony. Thank you, sir. Can everyone hear me? I, I want to make sure this microphone is effective for you guys in the back. OK, thank you very much. Well, as Colonel Holmes alluded to, my name is Major Anthony McCarty, and I'm the commander of the 325th Security Forces Squadron. Now, the 325th Security Forces Squadron is responsible for the protection of all of Tyndall Air Force Base to include its mission, its personnel, and, and the actual base itself. And my position as the commander is the equivalent to a police department chief of police to kind of put a perspective on that. So Colonel Holmes did a great job of introducing some folks. I just want to introduce a couple more folks uh, to you. So as we move into the intermission phase, if you have questions and you're more comfortable asking them on a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, there's a few more folks in the room I think would be, do a great job in answering some of those questions. First is uh, Major uh, Mike uh, Bernat. He runs my maritime operations out at the squadron. And then my uh, officer in charge of readiness and uh, logistics, Lieutenant Ronnie Ware, up here in the front row. Again. The public affairs uh, specialist that we've got with us, Colonel Holmes, myself, Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford, uh, I think many of you know uh, Mr. Herm Bell and Miss Ashley Wright, so they're going to be here as well. So during the intermission phase, if you're much more comfortable asking questions on a one-on-one -on -one setting, we'd encourage you to do so. All right, next chart. As Colonel Holmes alluded to, really what we're here to do is to inform you, our, our community, about our waterway security proposal. All right, and, and then he talked briefly about what we're going to do. We're going to start uh, with this educational briefing up front. Next chart, please. So a little bit about how we got here. So a lot of questions have been asked about is the, what's changed with the threat? Why are we doing this today? What's, what's changed? And the, question, or the answer to that question is nothing's really changed. You know, this, pro, this proposal was began to be developed about 10 to 12 years ago post the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And as the Department of Defense tends to do, we take a, a, a large or long look at each of our installations to ensure uh, to, that we identify any of those vulnerabilities. Vulnerability, vulnerabilities, excuse me. So over those last 10 to 12 years, we've had a couple of those assessments. And although some of the same things that make Tyndall Air Force Base very unique in the fact that it's surrounded by waterway have been addressed as a couple of major concerns because they provide some instant access to Tyndall Air Force Base and some of their resources. Now, it's important to note, too, that we're not trudging through brand new ground here. MacDill Air Force Base done something very, very similar in 2003 and when they had put into plan, a place a plan much like ours, as well as Eglin in 2012 to include some of our Coast Guard and our Navy brethren right here locally in Panama City. All right, now their plans vary a little bit based on what they're doing at each of those installations, their mission, and their geography, but essentially they have these plans in place as well. Next chart, please. So with the, plan, the plan's approval, what changes? And the answer is day in and day out, absolutely nothing changes. 
We do not anticipate, nor do we believe, that there's going to be a threat that would require us to enact a temporary restricted area in any capacity. Day in and day out, without the threat, uh, we would have no more law enforcement authority or the ab ability to execute any law enforcement authority in the waterway surrounding Tyndall Air Force Base. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't see my patrol boats out there, but they're not out there in any kind of law enforcement capacity. They're simply our eyes and ears to determine what's going on around the installation out there. They don't have any more law enforcement authority than they do today with the plan's enactment. So they're simply out there watching what's happening around Tyndall, and it's really just a great efficient way for a limited manpower that we do have on the installation to be able to traverse around those 129 miles of the coastline that surround our base. Now, for the purposes of today's briefing, what I wanted to do is to really step you through what the process looks like with regard to the proposal. And so in order to do that, I wanted to give you a hypothetical situation, all right? So I wanted to step you through each piece of this. Now, the first one is that this plan is completely threat driven. So as I said previously, there is no point day in and day out where we would enact this restricted area or temporary restricted area. However, should a threat arise, and, and again, there's no threat to Tyndall Air Force Base right now. We don't anticipate that there ever will be a threat. But should a threat arise, Working with what we refer to as the threat working group, which is nothing more than subject matter experts with regard to force protection and, and protecting Tyndall Air Force Base. Now, that group of subject matter experts also liaises regularly with our local law enforcement here to include the Joint Terrorism Task Force and our other federal departments. If a threat arise, uh, that arose that affected Tyndall Air Force Base, that threat working group would take a real hard look at that threat. It would analyze it determine what are the best mitigating actions that we would need to take in order to best protect Tyndall Air Force Base from that threat. Now, many, many times, that, those, that analysis and the, those mitigating efforts would not include restricting any waterway to, around Tyndall Air Force Base at all. However, for the purposes of our discussion, I wanted to use the what we freshwater bayou and the power lines that come onto the installation as a good example. So let's say that we have a threat that affects those power lines coming into that area. Now, once we've taken a look at that, and again, we may not ever need to restrict the water bay, waterway, but for the purposes of the discussion today, after we've done that analysis, the threat working group determines that some of the best mitigating effort would be to temporarily enact a restricted area around the power lines that feed onto the installation at, as they are a, a bulk share of how we get our power onto the base. And if we lost them, could be an opportunity for us to have a mission degradation. So they'll go to the installation commander with those recommendations, and should the installation commander enact a temporary restricted area in any capacity, obviously he's going to continue to communicate with the civic leaders, but he, we're also going to use the Army Corps of Engineers uh, public announcement uh, process, which includes uh, placing uh, the t noti notification of the temporary restricted area onto the maritime channels, I believe the channels are 13 and 16 for all the boaters, both, both, both professional and recreational boaters. And on top of that, the base would plan uh, utilizing media, social media, and using the web to get that as much information out as possible. Because any threat that would affect Tyndall Air Force Base, and I just want to drive that point home today, there is no threat to Tyndall Air Force Base right now or for the foreseeable future. But any threat that would affect Tyndall Air Force Base also affects our community, Bay County, you guys. And, and so we want as much information as we were able to get out to the community, we absolutely want to do that. So if the installation commander, again, on a very temporary and limited basis, decided to enact a restricted area, that process would be followed. Now, a couple questions that I've been asked is, you know, they ask, Major, what happens if my livelihood or my business would be affected by that very limited and very temporary nature of a restricted area? If you've taken a look at the plan that you have in front of you, if you haven't had an opportunity, I'd encourage you to read it. It's a pretty easy read. There's a lot of grid coordinates in there. Uh, but there's some meat and potatoes in a few of the pages. But if you take a look at page 8, there's a process for our local community members that 99.9% .9 of the, our neighbors that are enjoying those waterways just like we are to be able to get inside that temporary restricted area. They would get a written permission from the wing commander, sending it to the base. He would send that back to you. And then whenever you would go into that temporary restricted area, you would, you would have that letter with you, and, and you could use that water for, you know, using freshwater bayou as an example. I understand there's some great crabbing out there and some good fishing, all right? You could go into those areas without any issues. Now, what would a temporary restricted area look like if the wing commander, uh, the installation commander enacted it, all right? Essentially, it would look no different than what it looks like now. 
with the exception of you may see a, an Air Force patrol boat parked out there right off of that location. And, and the, I've been asked a lot of questions about, well, what kind of laws are you enforcing? You know, Tyndall Air Force Base, my security forces squadron, we're not concerned about, you know, maritime law enforcement from the perspective of, is your fire extinguisher certified? Do you have your flare gun? That's not what we're trying to accomplish here. What we're trying to accomplish is just to mitigate a threat to the installation itself. And so the only authority, the only law enforcement authority we would have would be in that very small, temporary restricted area. And again, just for the, only the duration that the uh, restricted area would be enacted. Day in and day out, without that restricted area, there's no additional law enforcement authority that we would have in any capacity around the installation. Now, a, another piece of that is, well, when does it end? I've had a lot of questions about, you know, if a temporary restricted area is enacted, when does it end? I, if you take a look at the plan and as you read through the plan, you'll see there are several different locations in the plan that talk about the second that the threat is gone, the installation commander would lift that restricted area. So not only is the plan short in duration and scoped only to the amount of area that we would be required to mitigate that threat, we also have that process where for our community members, our neighbors would be able to get into those temporary restricted areas if they, if they wanted to go, if they were out there fishing or if they were out there because their livelihood or their business depended on it, okay? So I wanted to take an opportunity. A lot of you have seen this map out on the social media and it's pretty imposing, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. You know, as you look at this map in front of you, you'll see that the entire property that Tyndall's responsible for is outlined in yellow and blue. The yellow simply indicates where the land stops and the water begins. That blue, that blue line that goes around the yellow line is that 500 foot maximum air buffer that we've been referring to. Now what's also important to note about that 500 foot buffer is that when those subject matter experts take a look at how we best mitigate the threat, it may not require all of that 500 foot. You know, that's the, the experts taking a look and saying, hey, that installation commander, this is all you need to do in order to best protect that area of the base. And so that is just what the maximum piece that we've put into place. Now, I will also tell you, we've worked very hard with the Army Corps of Engineers in taking a look at and ensuring that there's, there's not going to be an environmental impact or an economic impact to this. We're not going to affect the coastal waterways or recreational boulders' ability to traverse in and around the Air Force Base at, in any capacity. Now, the other question that I get quite frequently is, well, why do you plan on intending on restricting all of the waterways around Tyndall? And I will tell you, like we spoke about before, day in and day out, absolutely nothing changes. There's no additional law enforcement authority in the water executing any type of authorities whatsoever. <laughs> We're talking about when that heightened threat period happens and only when after it's been analyzed and communicated and, and use that checks and balances system. Now, what, but when people have seen this map, I, the next question I get is, well, Major, you're closing Shell Island and you're closing Crooked Island. So next chart. I want to talk a little bit about that. Again, I want to drive home the point in the day in and day out, absolutely nothing changes. You know, everyone will be able to use Shell Island just like they were able to before. You know, however, just like we wouldn't have been able to pre the terrorist attacks of 9-11, no one would have been able to, to believe that someone would have taken airliners and crashed them into facilities. From a prudent planning perspective, we needed to take a look at what is our worst case scenario and what is the property that Tyndall is responsible for. Because I don't know what Tyndall Air Force Base is going to look like in 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 years. And we don't know what kind of impact that Shell Island, period, that Shell Island would have to the Tyndall Air Force Base of the future. We only know that Tyndall Air Force Base is going to continue to be a viable part of their community, Bay County community, for a long time. And so from a prudent planning perspective, we had to take our entire property that we're responsible for into consideration. Now, on this map, you'll see a couple different color shades. This blue area that you see outlining Shell Island, that's the portion of Shell Island that Nintendo is responsible for, day in and day out. So, again, that's always open to the public, and we don't ever foresee an instance where we would have to restrict that waterway around Shell Island or Tyndall Air Force Base, or Crooked Island for that matter. Now, this area that you see here in the green, that's the state portion of Shell Island to include St. Andrews Park, that has no bearing or nothing to do with this proposal whatsoever. So as we would talk about any of these, you know, that finite chance that we would have to enact a temporary restricted area, we're only talking about the area that Tyndall is responsible for. All right, next chart. So what happens next? So, well, we're going to continue to communicate with our, our neighbors, our community. We're going to continue to make sure uh, that we're passing this information out. 
allowing for points of clarification, uh, asking questions, having a dialogue, making sure that all of us understand what this proposal is all about, the intent, the scope, what, is, what it's all about and what it's not all about. All right. Our, ultimately, our plan is that sometime within the first quarter of 2014, we'll look to submit this draft proposal back to the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, here's an important piece. As part of this process, just like we're standing here today having this discussion, in that period where we resubmit the draft package back to the Army Corps of Engineers, we're estimating it'll take somewhere between one to six months before that package begins to process through the Army Corps of Engineers. During that period, we're going to continue to have venues like this. We're going to continue to have the dialogue with our community and speak to everyone and, and answer those questions and make sure everybody understands what we're truly trying to do. We're going to do that with some informational articles. We're going to use that social media that we talked about. And then during that six-month period, there will be another public period of comment that we will let you know is coming up as we continue to track it through the process where us as a community, we can take a look at the draft proposal in its entirety on the Army Corps of Engineers webpage and provide public comment where the Army Corps of Engineers will have an opportunity to take every one of the comments that they receive and take a hard look at them, make sure that we haven't missed anything, we have dotted all our I's and crossed all of our T's. Ultimately, after that process, we think that entire process from start to finish will probably place us put, making an adjustment to the Code of Federal Regulations sometime within the end of 2014. And again, throughout that entire process, the plan is to make sure that we're communicating as a, as a community to, make, to answer any questions and to seek clarification. All right, next chart. So I wanted to thank you for, the, for spending some time with us this evening. I absolutely uh, appreciate it. I know you're extremely, extremely busy. And the men and women of, uh, at Tyndall Air Force Base cherish the relationship that we have as a community. And we're going to continue to build on that. So with that, Herm, what do you want to, about uh, 18, or 645? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, please take the next few minutes, stretch your legs. Again, if you have a question, come up and grab one of these folks in uniform, uh, Mrs. Bright and, and Mr. Bell, uh, myself. Uh, and then uh, if you have a question that you think would be best answered in the public forum so that everybody can, can hear the answer because it might be a question that several others have, please grab one of our cards, you know, put the question on the card and get it back to one of our public affairs specialists and we'll, be, we'll an attempt to answer as many of those as we can up until uh, 8 o'clock this evening. And any time we have available, again, we're going to have a, an open mic period where you can step up to the microphone for that secondary or tertiary question that may come up uh, while we're here. So thank you very much, and we're looking forward to answering any of your questions. All right, thank you guys for all the questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear Ms. Wright back there? Outstanding. All right, we have several questions that are kind of the same category, sir. Okay. So. Um, Basically, uh, first one's kind of deal with exercises. So can the restrictions be enacted during a drill? Well, you know, it's a great question. As a matter of fact, we were talking about that just a little bit ago during the intermission. And the short answer is no. You know, we would never enact a temporary restricted area just to exercise the capability. You know, if we were going to uh, practice that from an uh, uh, enforcement capacity, it would be only over the radio. So the worst thing you would see would potentially be a boat floating in the water out there talking on the radio. But we would never enact a temporary restricted area just to exercise or drill the capability. Okay. What is constituted as a threat? Can you give an example when the proposal could have helped in the past? You know, that's, it, that's a great question. The first piece is, is that no, in the two, almost two years that I've been here, there's never been a threat where I would tell you, I would recommend to the installation commander that we would need to act, enact some type of temporary restricted area. Uh, I haven't heard of one that's happened around Tyndall. This is just good prudent planning based upon those vulnerability assessments that we talked about during the briefing. All right. What measures will be put in place to ensure identification checks are uh, conducted by military personnel are not in violation of the protections afforded by the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, which prohibits unreasonable searches. Absolutely. Well, the first portion of that, and then I'll probably turn over to Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford as, as the lawyer in the room, uh, we're not checking IDs day in and day out. You know, day to day, when, when nothing's going on and we have no temporary restricted area enacted, we don't have the authority to do that. We don't have any type of law enforcement capacity at all. Now, as you talk about if a temporary restricted area would be enacted in a very small, small piece and only for a short duration, I don't know, Lieutenant Colonel Rutherford, do you want to answer that question? Sure. I think I've been reading the questions, kind of a little stack of questions about this, and I think some of the confusion is that our initial plan did have the identification check um, in it, if you saw that one of the more preliminary drafts. And 
you look and we realize that Florida law doesn't require you. That's right. If you're born before 1988, I think. It doesn't require you to have IDs when you're voting. And so we took that requirement out of the plan um, just because we didn't want to impose on you any requirement in addition to what Florida also um, requires. But if the restricted area is in place and we come up on the boat and you refuse to leave the area or there's something threatening, and let's say it's somebody with a bunch of weapons in their boat or something like that, then, then as law enforcement we have the authority to go ahead and um, board the boat and obtain some type of identification or identify you in some way for law enforcement. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Uh, Colonel Rothsard, you might want to step back up. <laughs> what law would one be charged with if refused to leave the area, and what would the penalty be? I'm assuming they mean during a temporary restricted area. Once that temporary restricted area is in place, we would come and ask you to leave. If you refuse to leave, you'd be in violation of federal law. Trespass would be the most likely thing we would um, charge you with. We'd cite you with it, depending on um, the situation. You'd most likely be in a citation and we would take you to a federal magistrate court. And um, there's a whole host of ranges of punishments available in magistrate court, but likely um, we often see a fine as one of the most um, common punishments in our federal magistrate co court program. If it was something more serious, we could take you to um, US federal court under the criminal laws there and prosecute you and, and there'd be all sorts of ranges of punishments available. Thank you again, ma'am. <laughs> Next. Is, uh, is Shell Island likely to be restricted when a threat uh, to the flight line is identified? It would, it would be completely contingent upon the threat after taking a hard look at it. Again, you know, day in and day out, nothing changes. And, and we want to look for every mitigating effort that we can possibly do before we would ever get into a discussion about temporarily restricting any waterways around Tyndall Air Force Base. And, and that would include that portion of Shell Island that we discussed during the actual briefing. <laughs> 